This is Patrick Dolans with another presentation in the IS Econ 104 Introductory Macroeconomics Series. In this presentation, we'll examine the evolution of money from what's known as commodity money up through the classic gold standard. When economists use the term commodity money, what we're referring to is something that satisfies our definition of money. Recall that includes both functions of medium of exchange and store of value, but it also has to have a separate usefulness as a commodity. So, for example, in history, colonial America, for instance, we know that nails were sometimes used as money. There are examples of grain throughout history in different times and places, but probably the most uh, classic example is gold or sometimes silver. In order for something to work as commodity money, it needs to have a handful of properties. Let's examine those. The first property is it needs to be durable. So livestock doesn't make a very good source of commodity money because it can die and that doesn't work well if it's a store of value. So durability is important, something that doesn't rot or die or perish. It needs to be relatively valuable in small quantities. That is to say, it needs to be portable. Imagine if we used rice as money. Think about how much rice it would take to buy several hundred dollars worth of textbooks. You'd need a wheelbarrow to conduct your transactions, and that's not very convenient. Portability is what we associate with valuable and relatively small quantities. The third property is it needs to be widely accepted. So it's got to be something that a wide range of people would find readily acceptable in exchange for goods or services. And that's sort of an understood or, or obvious property. The fourth property is it needs to be divisible. So what do we mean by that? Well, picture using cows as money. Never mind that they're not very dur durable or portable or widely accepted. Think about using cows as money. Now imagine you're at the bookstore purchasing your textbooks for the semester and you bring your cow Bessie to the cash register and they say, oh, your books are actually worth a little bit less than the, the cow that you've brought in for exchange. Uh, let's go get the chainsaw and we'll make change. Well, I don't want to be there when that happens and neither do you. So an important property of commodity money is that it's divisible, that it can be divided up into smaller quantities, recombined, and, and nothing is lost in the process. The final property is uniformity. So we need to be able to understand that quality will be consistent, that if I say 24 karat gold, you know exactly what that means, and we can verify that with some precision. Notice, of course, that gold and silver both satisfy all five of the properties on this list, which is why historically in different times and different places we've seen both gold and silver circulate as money, and each has a separate usefulness as a commodity. Okay, let's move on. The gentleman in this picture is Sir Thomas Gresham, an important name from the 16th century. Thomas Gresham is the person responsible for giving us Gresham's Law, which is identified here. Quote, an artificially overvalued money tends to drive an artificially undervalued money out of circulation. That's a fancy definition. Don't pay too much attention to this in terms of memorizing it or trying to understand it. You can come back and do that later if you'd like, but for our purposes, Gresham's law can be reduced to one very simple statement. Here it is. Bad money drives out good. We're going to illustrate Gresham's law with a handful of examples, and you'll want to be able to think about this and to maybe use examples to illustrate your understanding of it. So, before we move on to our historical examples, let me give you a couple of quick examples that are contemporary. If you've ever received Canadian money as part of your change, uh, you probably have the same response that, that most people do. Canadian coins, Canadian quarters, those quarters with caribou on them, um, are not really all that desirable. And so when I receive a Canadian quarter, by mistake typically, 
I will spin that thing as fast as I possibly can. That's Gresham's Law. A Canadian quarter doesn't work in a parking meter. It doesn't work in a vending machine. It's not something that I'm going to be able to use as easily as a U.S. quarter. And so my goal is to spend it as quickly as possible. Get it out of my hands. The hot potato image in the background here is sort of a, a symbol for what Gresham's Law is really about. Let me give you a different example. Let's say that in the course of your daily transactions, you receive a handful of change, and later on in the evening as you're looking through your coins, you notice that you've, you've got a quarter that's just a little different, and you study it carefully. It's U.S. quarter, no, no problem there. But when you turn it sideways, it's not one of the quarters that we're accustomed to with the copper middle. You look at a quarter sideways you'll you'll understand what I'm talking about instead when you look at this quarter in our, our hypothetical story it's silver all the way through you check the date and it turns out your quarters from let's say 1963 well we know that quarters from 1964 and earlier were 90 percent silver that's no longer the case. But one of those older quarters, so some of them are still floating around in circulation, not many, but, but some, those older quarters turn out to be worth more than $4 in terms of the silver content. So what should you do if you have a quarter that contains more than $4 worth of silver? Treat it like any other quarter. Use it in a parking meter, vending machine, to buy something that you're purchasing in your everyday transactions. Absolutely not. In fact, a parking meter will treat an old quarter as 25 cents. A vending machine will give you 25 cents worth of value. But if you and I both know that the silver content in that quarter is much higher than the 25 cent face value, then the obvious thing to do is to hoard or save or remove that quarter from circulation. That's the good money that disappears from circulation. And the next time you have a chance to spend money, you'll spend something that's only worth 25 cents and save the high silver content quarter. That's Gresham's Law as well. Let's use Gresham's Law to look at some historical examples. So we're going to start with um, England in the 1700s, early 1700s. The gentleman in the background here is Sir Isaac Newton who somehow managed to find himself in charge of the mint in um, the United Kingdom. Now, at that time, both gold and silver were circulating as money, and um, that's known as bimetallism. Two metals are, are used for the monetary system. That was not just common in England, but it would become important in, in early colonial America. It was uh, popular in France. It's, it's not something that was uniquely British. In any case, gold and silver are circulating side by side. The ratio that the mint is exchanging the two metals at is off a little bit. Isaac Newton's in charge. He's got to fix the ratio. This is a man who co-invented calculus. He ought to be up to the task of figuring out a, a simple uh, mathematical ratio based on market values. And surprise, he gets it wrong. In 1717, Isaac Newton makes the mistake of creating gold that is overvalued and silver that is undervalued. In other words, the ratio that he created made gold worth less as um, a metal than it was as a coin. And so, of course, it would be used as a coin. But his ratio choice made silver far more valuable as a commodity than it was as a coin. And so much like the very old coins, U.S. quarters, in our earlier example, silver disappears. Another fancier way of saying that is that England, based on Sir Isaac Newton's mistake, embarks upon a de facto gold standard in 1717. By a de facto standard, we mean it, it wasn't official, it was never formally acknowledged in 1717, but it might as well have been official, because silver disappears as coin, and gold becomes the dominant choice. Well, that's more or less a one metal standard or a gold standard. It took Parliament another hundred years to make it official, which they do in 1821, 
and it's another 30 some odd years before any other nation makes it official that they too will be on a single metallic standard, a single standard that's only gold-based, and that's Portugal. A few more years pass before 1871 when the next piece of the puzzle comes into play. Turns out that what we now think of as Germany had fought yet another war with, with uh, France. The, the so-called Germans, not Germans yet, but the Germans at that time uh, are victorious. And one of their conditions of, of peace is that they be paid in exclusively gold. They use this stockpiling of gold from their, their French adversaries to convert to a gold-only standard and remove silver from their sort of official monetary base. That's 1871. Relatively quickly, four nations, which were um, very important trading partners for the Germans, Denmark, Holland, Norway, and Sweden, also adopt a gold-only standard. And then it's just a matter of a few more years before the so-called Latin Monetary Union, France, Belgium, Italy, and Switzerland, uh, convert to a gold-only standard. And the last big player to join is the United States in 1879. Notice then that in less than a decade, what was only the UK and Portugal is now something along the lines of, of a dozen major economic European powers and, and the U.S., in any case, when we talk about the international gold standard, that's more or less the starting point, 1879. And it's the idea that gold is what's backing currency for a generation or so. The international gold standard uh, comes into crisis in 1914 with the beginning of World War I, and it never really quite recovers. But that's a subject for a different conversation in a different time and place.